Good morning, traders. Welcome to the Bookmap Pro Trader webinar series. Uh, today we have Brent Kachuba, or otherwise known as Spot Gamma. Uh, he's going to go over understanding option, options gamma levels uh, within the order flow. Uh, you might uh, be uh, aware of his subscription service, and uh, he's offering, uh, uh, well, I guess he'll get into some of the details, but uh, uh, levels within Bookmap, um, and uh, you can um, have them come directly into uh, the uh, the column within book map. So you have them right there uh, within the heat map. Um, let's go through the risk disclaimer. Trading futures, equities, and digital currencies involves substantial risk of loss and is not suitable for all investors. Past performance is not necessarily indicative of future results. A little bit about Brent. Uh, if you guys are haven't, haven't seen him before, we had one other webinar with him. Uh, he's been an equities trader and derivatives trader for almost 20 years. So he's got a ton of institutional background here, working with B of A and Credit, Credit Suisse um, as equities broker and in algorithmic sales and trading. Uh, then he was uh, with um, uh, institutional sales for Wolverine, uh, representing their electronic derivatives trading platform. And currently Brent is, um, he, he's trading some proprietary strategies uh, and he's running spotgamma.com, uh, which publishes, very, publishes various metrics on uh, options data. Various metrics, they're in detail. Uh, it's really, really a very nice service. I've really never seen anything quite like it, to be honest. Um, let me just uh, go over here. If you're interested in reaching out to Brent, here is his contact information. Don't worry, I'll put uh, all of this into the GoToWebinar chat. Uh, just copy and paste it right in there so that you guys can click directly on the links. He's got his website here and his subscription service. Uh, you've got his email here, his Twitter handle, and then also um, uh, Bookmap Partners, they get special uh, uh, offers uh, that you guys can uh, uh, purchase Bookmap uh, using this link here. Uh, and there's some some special deals on Bookmap. So uh, uh, for three months, a year, or for lifetime, uh, some special offers if you're interested in that. Uh, I'll put all of these into the chat for you. Uh, and then let me just turn it right over to Brent. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Bruce. Um, I appreciate you having me on and uh, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk to all of you guys. And uh, bear with me here as I make sure I have the appropriate screen lined up here. <laughs> uh, I see the windows. Uh, screen. Okay, that is definitely the one you do not want to see right now. I wanted to show everyone quickly the. Um, hopefully, you can there, see my see, book map screen. I see book map. Yeah. All right, cool. I wanted to jump to this real quick. Uh, this is not about the topic of the presentation, but I like to sort of put myself on the spot a little bit here. Um, futures are obviously trading pretty much lower, and we have two interesting levels so far today, which is the 3300. Uh, there's a lot of open interest in options up there, and that's a key hedging level and the market kind of respected that. And then the low is this combo strike, which I can get into a little bit later um, of 32.67, and that's an SPX 32.67, so you have to adjust that to the December futures contract. So uh, it'll be interesting to see if this target happens kind of by the end of the webinar here. Um, and if not, there'll be a little egg on my face, but let's see what happens. So at any rate, um, again, thank you everybody. So today we're gonna talk a little bit more about uh, single stock gamma uh, and the ability um, to use some of these interesting levels um, that we produce in single stocks and and how that uh, what we do for futures applies into um, again single single names like apple and the like so bruce can you see my uh, book map presentation here hopefully you can sorry uh no back to the windows i see the windows uh, icon there yeah. There we go. Now I see. Okay. Now now I see. All right. Sorry, everybody. Uh, I'm going to get better at this stuff eventually. Um, so one of the things we want to talk about is what our general service is. So how we came to work with Bookmap is we produce uh, these futures trading levels that are based off of SPX options. Many of you are probably familiar with that. We've done a lot of videos. There's a ton of information. We've done a few uh, presentations with uh, Bookmap in the past that discuss this uh, at length. So I won't dig in too much into that too much of this presentation, but basically what you need to know is that we look at all the open interest in the S&P 500 and the SPY, and we produce these support and resistance levels um, and volatility estimates. 
uh, in, and those translate into the ES futures market. So at the open there, we just showed our two levels for today, and we produce what our expected move on the day in terms of standard deviation, you know, how big of a range we expect to see and how we think the market will move. And um, I don't say this to sort of uh, uh, show an ego or anything like that, but the, the levels have been just really spot on. You know, these uh, we produce them and they, they show up in, in your book map feed every day. Um, and I and I think they've been really helpful for a lot of people. And there's a five-day trial if you want to try this stuff out. Um, you'll get access to the the full suite of um, of levels and metrics. You can pull in the cloud notes and and just watch that as we go. So with that, I'm going to dig into the um, into the idea of gamma just real quick, and then how we can apply that to single stocks. So what we do is. Um, we look at market gamma and a lot of people hear this phrase gamma and, and it's a Greek and their eyes probably glaze over a little bit, but all, all you need to know is that gamma is an estimate of volatility in the market. And it's a measure of volatility in the market because it is an estimate of how much dealers will hedge and options market makers will hedge the underlying equity or the underlying, in this case, futures, if you were looking at SPX options, right? So the two key questions that you need to ask yourself, and this pertains very much to equities because it's, you know, there's, 3,800 different equities, and each one has, some have big options volumes, and some have very small options volumes. So these are important questions to ask. So number one is how much volume do option players produce? Um, and obviously, if there's more options trading in a name, there's more hedging in a name, right? So there's going to be more of an impact from options market makers and dealing, dealers if there are bigger positions and bigger volumes, right? Um, and then the second question you need to ask yourself is how are dealers positioned, right? Are they long calls or are they short calls you know our dealers net long puts or then and then that short puts and all you need to know about that is based on how we think they're positioned how dealers are positioned i.e long or short options we can then produce volatility estimates and all volatility estimates are is how much do we think a, a given name is going to move on the day right and then the third one is where are those positions concentrated in the in the case of the of the chart that we showed at the open, there's a lot of open interest at the 3,300 strike in SPX. That was a key resistance level today. There's also a lot of open interest at this 3,267 level, which we'll see if that level gets tagged uh, as well um, as a support area here. So again, those are the two things you really need to know. Gamma is simply an estimate of how much volatility there's going to be in a name, and we'll dig into that a little bit more. At the end of the day, you don't even need to know what an option is and need to know you know what gamma is or how to calculate it right but what you do need to know is what is that metric telling you it's like bruce and i were talking before you don't need to know how an engine in a car works in order to drive it right you just need to know sort of what the output of this model is so please don't get turned off you know by this concept of market gamma and and needing to know greeks and how things are hedged and the like we try to sort of distill it down for everybody um so all right so back to this idea of volatility and gamma in the SPX, what we do is we measure this thing, and you probably he heard about it before, a positive gamma market versus a negative gamma market. This is a very common chart we show a lot of people. And what you just, again, need to know tied to this volatility idea is that when we have a positive gamma market or we calculate that dealers are positioned in a positive gamma stance or, or way, there is less volatility in the S&P 500 than when there's a negative gamma position. So right now we have a negative gamma position in the S&P complex. And that infers that there's going to be a lot of volatility. So you can see the price distribution really widens out when there's a negative gamma distribution. So if I was a swing trader, if I was a futures trader, I would be looking to play 1% moves, 2% moves, you know, big swings in the market. Whereas if it was a positive gamma market and there was a lot of positive gamma as calculated by our metrics, I would be looking to scalp, right? Play tighter swings in names and I'm going to adjust my trading accordingly. Um, so those are that's sort of what the impact is of gamma uh, and what you sort of need to know or sort of when you translate that, what you should be looking for, right? One of our most popular questions is, great, you, put, you produce these metrics, but how am I using it? Well, this volatility metric or volatility um, calculation is showing you what the expected volatility is and, and then you can set your trading uh, accordingly. So one of the other interesting things about this, and this is a recent note, and it doesn't directly tie to sort of what we're getting at today, but it's just something I want to share with everybody, is this is the open to close level overnight. Um, and then here's the previous close to open. So this is the overnight trading versus the day session. And what you can see is this is plotted based on each of these points are just 
uh, for a given night how much gamma we calculated on a day. And what you can see is so interesting is that you get a same profile in movement. So the x-axis here is the move on the day, right, from a 24-hour basis. So, to, so today is open, so, so the point today, let's say 6 a.m. to tomorrow at 6 a.m., what was the return for a given gamma point? And you can see that overnight, it respects the gamma or the moves fall into the same buck, bucket or bin as what happens during the day session. Um, and I'd always thought, you know, there's this common chart of the market performs better if you sort of buy the close and sell the open. And I had thought that that was because the overnight market just had a more positive return. And, and there is a positive skew in here. But really what's so interesting about it is there's way more big negative moves during the cash session than there are during the overnight session. So it's also kind of an interesting thing because if you think if I only own stocks, you know, or if I'm long futures when there's a positive gamut environment, what is my max exposure, right? Well, it looks like around minus 2% overnight is sort of the biggest move you've calculated. And, and this goes back to January of 2018. So it can help you sort of manage your risk mentally and sort of put things into a framework of expected moves and sort of, you know, handling some of the, uh, again, the risk or, or sort of what your perceived moves uh, will be depending on whether we have again this positive or negative gamma environment. Um, so you know this is this is something again we we have some posts on our website about if you want to dig into a little bit more. It's just something I want to bring up as it's a fairly recent study that we produced. The other thing I wanted to mention about SPX options, particularly uh, after this prior expiration, 918 was a big expiration, and what I mean by that is the third Friday of every month is when we have the large SPX monthly contracts expire. And most institutional players tend to trade in that monthly expiration. So there was a lot of uh, options that rolled off uh, this past Friday. And in SPX, that can kind of create some volatility. And, you know, I think we've sort of seen that really spill over Monday. Um, but you can see that, you know, the February high uh, pre-COVID crash here um, was the day before options expiration and you could see that you know the market just really careened and what was so interesting is that the March low in S&P was the Monday after uh, the March big March expiration so you know those two points I think that's kind of beyond coincidence that you have that sort of velocity or that uh, that change in market stance um, around that options expiration event and you can sort of look back and you know obviously there's not always a coincidence right there's some confirmation bias in how these things move but when you get big positions expiring particularly in, particularly in single stock you can see this impact and, and something i think you need to be aware of as a trader and sort of how you're going to address and and uh, play different moves uh one other thing to mention here as well tied to what i just talked about is this measures spx but what you can basically see is the third weeks before OPEX. So this is where options expiration takes place. So what this chart is showing you is that as we move towards that third Friday expiration, volatility contracts. And I've seen this in single stocks as well. So what I mean by that is where the large open interest is in the name, the market will sort of consolidate and the volatility will reduce into options expiration. Again, this is what just happened on Friday. And then the week after expiration, it's like the, the range is released, right? The trading range and sort of the grip that the dealers had is released and the expansion takes place, right? Now we have a lot of volatility in the week after expiration, and then we sort of build back into expiration and volatility contracts. And it's this cycle of movement um, that you can see. And I think if you bring up a lot of stock charts, you can sort of flag where expiration was. And uh, I'll, I'll show some of those examples uh, here shortly. So one of the things that I want to shift into, and it's been such a big story, is this idea of SoftBank and uh, and Gamma. And I did a, a a podcast with some guys called Market Huddle this past Saturday, where I really dig into this. Um, and one of the things that we think was such a big driver of markets moving higher in August is this concept of of um, uh, of positive Gamma, right? And the idea that as calls are bought by retail or by SoftBank or other players, it forces dealers to buy the underlying. So calls are bought and that makes dealers have to hedge themselves by buying stock. And so you can see that as more calls are bought, you would get this reflexive cycle of more dealers having to buy stock that pushes the stock up, which leads more people to wanna to buy calls. And, and that's a self uh, reinforcing kind of cycle higher. And you can see that 
there's a lot of data and metrics to support this theory and this idea. But what's also interesting about that is that when that mechanism breaks, meaning when people stop buying calls, all the dealers have to do is unwind those long hedges they had. So the, they're going to do is sell off all those stock hedges. And when you think about how quickly this unwind happened, uh, you know, last week, it took, you know, two weeks to gain 10% in the S&P in like two days, or uh, in a lot of these underlying names, excuse me. And, you know, what, I think it was like two days basically to unwind all that long position. Um, so you get these very violent moves when you build up gamut in single stocks. And so what we do when we look at single stocks is we assume that that options dealers on net are short calls and short puts, right? Which is another way of saying that most people who are trading single stocks are buying calls and buying puts. Now I understand that there's a whole lot of people out there who are selling options to get premium on different names and they're doing overrides and the thing like that. But on net, we believe that, and again, it does vary name to name, but when we look at modeling 3,800 different securities, which, which is what we do, we assume dealers are short calls and short puts, which means that as the stocks go up, dealers have to buy stock. And as the stocks go down, they have to sell and or short to hedge themselves. And so you can see theoretically how when there's a whole bunch of options positioned, how when they the dealers have to buy or sell, they can really start moving a stock around, right? So that short call, short put is called a negative gamma position. And all that is telling you is the dealers have to hedge in the direction of the stock. So momentum trades are popular or, or should be effective in names with big options complexes or trading. And if you just sort of want a visualization of what that is, you know, we just need to look at Tesla, uh, which we're gonna talk about here in a second. Um, this calls reloaded slide here just talks about this cycle of, of expiration. So you can see that calls build up, we hit the big expiration, in this case, this was July, it resets the, the complex, so to speak, and then we build again into August, and then the calls reset. So again, in September, we just had another reset where you know call positions or put positions are going to get rebuilt, and we'll see uh, how that how that uh, plays out going forward here. Um, so understand, I guess, the rhythm of the cycle, right? The the once a month cycle, so to speak. Uh, so again, uh, what we're trying to do do here when we look at these single stock positions. We're trying to identify places where volatility is going to expand, right? We want to get long in those areas or where volatility is going to contract or pin. And so those pinning areas are going to be targets by you know, long or short resistance areas and or where do I want to get long exposure to certain names because I think a volatile move is about to happen. And I'm going to go through some names also in real time. We can look at our, we call it our equity hub tool and look at some charts here in Bookmap, which does a great job of, of exhibiting uh, where liquidity shows up, obviously, in, in these single stocks and see if it lines up with some of our options levels. So what we do when we look at single stocks is we produce this options map. And this is this comes from our website. I'll show you how it works shortly. But what you need to sort of know here is that we map call gamma, which is essentially just looking at how calls are positioned in a name. And then the orange line is put gamma. So put gamma is telling you how much puts are in a name. So in, so in Apple, it is dominated by call options. Whether that's guys shorting calls or looking to get long exposure, there's typically very little put buying or put interest in Apple relative to the amount of calls. And so what's important to look at here is how much open interest exists in Apple, and it's a lot, and the volume is very high. So it's a very interesting name to watch from, a, from an options perspective. And what you also get to sort of comfortable with is we, we tell you how much gamma is in a name, and this is a lot of gamma, right? There's some names that have, say, a million dollars of gamma, and what you kind of need to do is just sort of get used to looking at how much gamma there is, you know, how big is the size of the options complex versus underlying volume. I'm not going to dig into that here, but just know that when you start to use the tool or you start to look at it, you want to know, okay, you know, how much hedging impact is there really versus the underlying volume? And so along with, okay, here's call volume and put volume, what are the key levels that I need to pay attention to? And these dotted lines show you various levels that are important in the name. And this will be things like where the largest call or put concentrations are. We have a couple of um, specific models that we run to produce key points. For instance, this inflection point here where these two call gamma and put gamma areas separate is often a support and resistance zone. And then the second thing to know is I talked earlier about volatility expansion and momentum. What this line is telling you is that as Apple moves up, 
it is picking up dealer hedging. Dealers need to start buying and sort of chase the name, so to speak, in accordance with the sort of steepness or the slope of this blue line. And I hope that makes sense and I'll answer a lot of questions around this. But basically, what if I was going to get long this name, I would wait for it to catch into this blue area because I think that it's going to pick up dealer hedging and get into this sort of call feedback buying cycle, right? And that can force the name higher as, as the name goes up, dealers want to buy, and you can see that the feedback mechanism could push this name higher. And conversely, if it starts to sell off, I know that I would want to play a short down to, into where this volatility tails off, right? Into this inflection point where the name starts to lose some of that momentum. excuse me there so here's a here's an example that i find very interesting it was from a little bit earlier and there used to be this site robin track and i think it's stale data now which is unfortunate uh, but one of the things obviously as traders we look for is you know a catalyst of some sort right so just because you know the the options setup it shows that there could be a lot of momentum in the name it doesn't necessarily mean that that things will take off right call buying does sort of uh infer or foist the hedging ob obligations of dealers to keep buying the stock but you need continuous call buying or some other metric to help obviously push the stock higher and so home had this really interesting setup because the number of robin hood accounts was just screaming higher um and so what was fascinating about it is this was from the day um you know these these two charts coincide on the same day and you could see that the setup in the name showed that there could be a lot of momentum up in the stock. So you've seen these names that were going up 20%, you know, and you go, when is this thing going to stop? How do, you know, when do we want to short this thing, right? It's It just keeps going higher. So 20% today, you know, we're down 20% today, like Nicola, you know, when do I play a bottom? What may be an inflection point? And I think these options metrics can really show you where that inflection point may be. So in this case, you know, there's a lot of gamma set up in, in the home, ticker home, and it seemed to top out around this 15, 16 area. And what's so fascinating is that they had earnings and, and the stock really respected this area and this level, right? And if you think mentally about what's happening in the position is, you know, we show there's all this gamma, dealer have to buy, has to, dealers have to buy the stock to hedge themselves as this thing rips up. And what you see is that, you know, this is after hours, but we need to hedge our exposure, right? There was this earnings play and a lot of momentum in the name and it does sort of extend past that sort of 15 zone right into the 16 zone and then it immediately sort of settles back down under this you know under this curve right that's that hedge and, and there's there's numerous examples of this happening and, and as you sort of start to watch the options set up it you know it can really offer some uh, a way to contextualize a lot of the moves that are taking place uh, particularly in times of expiration when there is no move and you'll see a stock down three four percent on expiration day and, and you're not sure why there is no news well it can be because again expiration and dealers have to unwind positions or or adjust their their hedging setup um sorry i'm going the wrong way here here we go so one of the things i wanted to show which is interesting about tesla is uh the change of the volatility right and and so what we had here was on 710 before Tesla earnings, there was a lot of people positioned, and this was in July, a lot of people positioned to play this name, right? And this gap between the orange line, which is put gamma, and, and the blue line, which is call gamma, again, infers that there's a lot more position, people positioned long in this name. And that can have consequences for the stock as it moves higher or lower. And what's so interesting about this is that you can see here when I flip to post earnings, the shape, so to speak, of this gamma totally changed, right? So here we had this big gap between call gamma and put gamma. And then what happened was right after earnings, implied volatility, as many of you know, collapses right after earnings because the news is out and all those options deflate. And so what happens is these call positions collapse and suddenly puts pick up a lot of, a lot of momentum because the name started to trade down all that implied volatility collapses. And so dealers who were long a bunch of stock to hedge out that those long call positions suddenly can now unwind those long positions, right? Because volatility's collapsed, those calls lost a lot of money, and now dealers can unhedge and unwind. And that can create a downward movement in the stock and pressure down on the stock, even if the earnings are good, uh, simply because the mechanics of what's happening with all those options positions can really sort of inflict uh, movement on, on the position. So, so again, this, this 
gap here between the call game and put game is really key. And it tells you sort of, are calls controlling my position or are puts controlling my position? So we highlighted these levels here uh, on the slide. And just to show you what essentially happened here, this is 710, right? So this is going into the earnings, which is this chart here. And so you can see that leading into this big ramp, which is this level in the stock, which at the time was a major move. And, and then, you know, Tesla made even bigger moves following this. But you can see there was this ramp. And I think a lot of this ramp is because of this positioning and people buying calls and sort of front running earnings, so to speak, uh, you know, getting in front of that earnings move. And you have this big tick up, right, in the name. And why does that happen? Well, again, I think it's because of dealers. And then again, into earnings, you know, it was the same thing. And this is the this is this chart here, you know, the post earnings crush where you see the, the stock just trade down. It doesn't look like a big move, but this is a hundred and fifty, two hundred dollar move down on the stock, right? Even though earnings were good, volatility crushes after hours, it had a nice rally, but market on open, volatility gets crushed, dealers have to unwind positions, and you end up with this sort of gamma map or shape to the to the name after earnings. So hopefully that point is being made and I'm I'm able to translate that that well and I'll, I'll again show some more examples here and, and happy to answer a lot of questions about that um, one of the names that is sort of a little bit more of a current event which is interesting is Apple and so you know this is the trend in Apple for all of August and I highlight a few levels here there's a lot of people who wanted to play getting in long before earnings or excuse me before the split uh, with the with the feeling that that was somehow free money or something along those lines and so this is August 31st, which again, you had to own the stock to get the split. And after the split, you know, the, the name really just kind of tanked. And so what's interesting about that, this is the 125 level, which you just keep that in the back of your mind. So this is the August 28th chart. There was a lot of options expiring on August 28th. We noted that this 500 strike, which is 125 uh, split adjusted, was had just a ton of options related there. And there was a ton of people positioned at that level. And you can see that there was, again, this sort of pin or move into just into August 28th. And then on expiration day, we kind of had the, again, the expansion that day. And then we sort of reverted back to that level and, and fell through it. Um, so we map out, you know, the 500 strike, which is, again, is the 125 split adjusted here. And note how many people were positioned in calls. I mean, everybody was in long calls uh, on this, um, in this name. And then as those unwind, you know, again, after expiration, you know, there's an unwind associated with it. And I think that can be reflected here, here in the, in the stock uh, selling off. If we look at September options expiration now, it's a similar story, right? This is now split adjusted. We show 112 is a really big area of expiration. Uh, and that again, will, you know, at the time 918, which is Friday, had a lot of contracts expiring on, on uh, that Friday. And you can see the name, this is 112, in that stock name, you can see the stock really just sort of mean reverting around that level um, into expiration. And you know these these levels will pick pick up and show quite often. And it's not you know you have so much ex, uh, open interest in Apple, it's very hard to sort of pin 112, right? There's a lot of people playing a lot of different uh, positions here. And as options are being added or removed, you know it changes it change hedging flows. But this 112 zone. You know, I think it's not a coincidence that the name sort of more or less pegs that area into you know, into expiration. Um, you know, Peloton into earnings again. This is another similar thing, and I, I won't um, sort of go through that similar idea or similar uh, position again in the chart. I want to talk about sort of a live example that I think is kind of uh, interesting, um, which which some of you guys may appreciate. One of the names that really showed up on our screen today was Oracle, and obviously it's in the news, which is so it has catalyst. There's this TikTok. Um, you know, metric and, and um, uh, not metric, but tick, tick -tock, tock acquisition and sort of changes the face of who Oracle is. And so that has some positive, you know, vibes with it, right, for lack of a better word. And what's so interesting is that's manifested in the options position. There's a lot of people with upside calls in this name and it's short term day trading type players, which means that the volatility in name could pick up because of that. As day traders buy, that really forces you know, active hedging, apologize for that ding. And so you can get a big move, say, into this Friday, and then dealers will, and then, excuse me, uh, traders will reload next Friday's expiration. You can kind of get this feedback me mechanism, this buying reflexive feedback mechanism in the name. And so what I wanted to do was just pull up a quick chart here of Tesla and Opal, or excuse me, of Oracle. And if you look at my book map, 
I'll zoom out here a little bit. Um, shrink this down. So Oracle for today, you know, 60 is a big level. So if you look at this this area, this dotted line here shows you that the biggest open interest is in the 60 strike. And that's right where these put gamma and call gamma areas kind of converge. And we sense we our model senses this as a key hedging area. So it should be a support area. And if we can spark some momentum, it looks like this thing could really run up into the 65 level. And so if you tick back into the actual chart uh, book map shows you here that 60 is a level that's the stock has been holding, right? It's been playing in here now. We have a little bit of weakness in the name, but we would look for sort of mean reversion back to the 60 area. And if we can get some momentum going, you know, a little positive piece of news, we do think that the vol the volatility potential, in other words, how much momentum we could get could really, you know, send this thing quite a bit higher. Uh, and so you could see that setup is here, right? Doesn't mean that the stock obeys that setup. And and obviously, if the markets overall really sell off, you know that will pressure this this name a little bit lower. But the momentum or the setup here is is really quite interesting. Um, so back to this equity hub tool, what it allows you to do to speak about the tool specifically, and I wanted to run through some some real time examples here, is we can go into uh the spot gamma equity hub here and type in a different uh, uh, uh type in some names right and so i loaded some of these things so they'd be live so like roku is kind of an interesting name to watch recently and i like to kind of put myself on the spot a little bit here um and see what roku tells us so here's the map we like to call it for roku you can see how much open interest is in the name where the put and calls are all positioned how much gamma and delta there is and again you don't need to know what the the options math is to uh to get a lot of out of this tool i think what you need to know is here are the support and resistance levels this is what we're talking about at the end of the day and then you know how much is positioned how much gamma is positioned in the name Oracle has quite a bit more position, uh, a quite a bit larger option position at the moment, which is something that makes it a little more interesting. But you can see, again, there's a lot of people positioned in calls uh, in Roku. And we note that the 200 strike is where the most calls are positioned, right? So that's the 200 strike here. And the other th interesting thing to note is that the top gamma expiration and top delta expiration, which is where there's huge concentrations from an expiration perspective, is not until October. So these are longer term positions. I would expect less sort of quick turnover in the name. Um, and that is quite a bit different from Oracle, which had the largest concentration on 925, which is likely people may be playing that, you know, TikTok deal or positive news. So if we flip back to the chart, you could see that we're under that 200 level. And if you look at sort of the convex convexity or the line here, we're kind of, you know, in this 180, 190 area. And that should build or this does infer that the momentum should carry this thing up into the 200 area um you know if the momentum can continue now if we're going to check to the downside you would note that there's a lot of expiration around the 180 area in the name and so you know that's not a level that's coming into play here uh at the moment uh but you can see that there is a lot of liquidity down here around 190 and then I think we traded down to 180 yesterday. I think unfortunately though, yeah, 180 uh, at the open, excuse me, this morning um, was where we sort of came in and then we had the momentum kind of catch it and pick it back up. Um, one of the other names I had tagged was uh, Nicola, which is interesting. I don't know how this thing is trading today. It obviously had a very bad day yesterday uh, and looks like we tagged down to the 25 area. So if we look at the map, so to speak here, let's check this out. Um, you can see again, not a huge option complex. What's so interesting about this name is that you could see puts just dominate in this name, right? Everybody's betting that this thing is just kind of kind of tank and it's going to get beat up pretty badly. Not a lot of people looking for big upside. So what's interesting about these puts being positioned at is there any if what's so interesting, excuse me, about the puts position in this name is that if you do get some positive news, you could see a pretty good blast of short covering because of you know the amount of uh, long puts that are. are perceived to be long puts in this name so you could really see sort of a sharp rebound uh, up in the 40 area if that if that catalyst appears uh, but we know there's a lot of options concentrated in the 29 and 30 area um, so our, our model picks up 29 as the uh, as kind of the big strike and if we kind of flip over it looks like that name has been in play you know for for much of the morning or for the afternoon so uh, so hopefully 
you all can sort of see or get a feeling for what how the options can help you map out, you know, regardless of what your trading strategies and equities and or futures, you can kind of see how this option data and information can be used. We are looking at building a cloud notes link for uh, all the stocks that we cover. Um, that's something that we are developing now and need to test out. But we hope to make available basically that if you subscribe to the Equity Hub, you'll be able to just sort of plug in our data feed uh, and have all these levels mapped out uh, for you on Bookmap. So I know that was a lot of information. I try to talk fast because I know that there is a uh, relatively volatile day. You can ch check the charts here. Uh, it didn't quite tag that 67 area looks like, but uh, the day is still young. So uh, with that, Bruce, I don't know if you want to take any questions or if we have any questions, but I'm, I'm happy to help. Yeah, sure. Uh, so Jerry is asking, um, uh, you mentioned SoftBank um, and I yeah. uh, wanted to take a look at that. And then um, Barbara. Barbara wanted to take a look at Amazon as well. Sure. So um, in terms of SoftBank, as a stock, I don't have any data on that. Uh, is he asking about sort of how the mechanism of SoftBank worked or just sort of the, some of the idea behind what their trading was? Yeah. How important are the options in the, in the play and why? Yeah. So um, so with SoftBank, it was it was more a matter of what SoftBank, the fund, was doing. And, and they had bought a lot of call spreads in various names like Microsoft and Apple, uh, Microsoft and Adobe, excuse me. And so when they bought those call spreads, what they do is they sort of foist a hedging obligation onto dealers so that when stocks go higher, like Microsoft and, and Adobe go higher, dealers have to buy stock to keep up, right? And so it came out in the news that that SoftBank had bought massive positions, you know, 75,000 call, call spreads in Microsoft and a similar position in Adobe and a few others. And so that can lead to this upside volatility. If you remember that there was this weird situation where like the VIX was going up or implied volatility in different names was going up as the stock went up. And that was, I think, a big reason to essentially what the way to look at it is the market was crashing up. That's how I look at at sort of August. And so SoftBank was being, you know, assigned a lot of the responsibility or sort of catalyst for, you know, so many of these tech names just going kind of bananas into August and, you know, being up four or five percent a day. And um, and then sort of also, you know, there's a violent unwind of that, right? That bottle unwind of the position or the hedges, you know, when the mechanism sort of the hedging mechanism turns on itself. Um, and so that was what was so interesting about SoftBank because those positions were so big uh, and because retail was positioned so long, those those two or that sort of net option position was such a catalyst for the, the the rise into August. And I think that sort of collapse and kind of just really just mean reversion uh, here into September. Um, so hopefully that helps to answer your question. Um, uh, please let me know if it didn't. And then I will. Uh, no, I think I, th I think that, uh, yeah, he says, thank you. Uh, okay. So And I did, you know, I, again, I don't, I don't mean to, uh, pump something else but i did the, the market huddle podcast just this past saturday uh which we talk you know a lot about that topic specifically um one of the things i you know i'm very embarrassed of, of bruce is that i uh i don't have the historical data on here for, <laughs> which i just realized when i was looking at this morning so i'll go back as far as i can here uh for the amazon trade uh but let's look up amazon and equity hub and just take a look and see what we have for today and these positions are updated every night um, and they're based on the open interest from last night so if we look at Amazon 3000 is a big level uh, and that is because we have what we call the hedge wall so what the hedge wall is is our model looks at all the open interest in the name and it picks up where there's a big change or or inflection point in how dealers may hedge for those of you who are familiar with our our S&P product we call this the volatility trigger uh, we don't call it the volatility trigger in Amazon because, or in single stocks because our assumption is that dealers are always short or negative gamma position. So there's no real volatility trigger. The hedge wall has a very similar concept, um, except for we think it's a major support or resistance area. And so that shows up as 3,000 as well as very big, uh, just overall huge positions. That's what this key gamma and delta strike are telling you, that there's just a lot of near-term options and longer-term options position there. And that most of those positions don't expire till October. So that tells me that these are longer term, probably bigger players positioned in the name, because again, that doesn't the when when the largest expiration is out in a major third Friday expiration, like 
October 16. That tells you generally that it's probably more institutional traders who are going to be holding that position uh, closer into expiration. If this said, you know, 925, I'd say, oh, that's a lot of retail, and I'd be looking for a lot more volatility in this name as a result. Uh, but again, 3,000 is kind of this key level, which should be defended. Obviously, it's a big round number, which people like as well. And uh, and it, I think the low overnight, I think yesterday we did breach the 3,000 level, and it kind of looks like we maybe tagged that this morning and, and bounced off of that. Um, I do not see, though, sort of the similar catalyst of, you know, this big gap uh, between call gamma and put gamma, you know, holding in here. And so, you know, I think there's a little bit of fuel to the name to the upside, but it's not the same sort of position that it was in August where, where we saw, you know, just large outright call positions. Um, you can see there's a, I would say this is a differing view in how people are playing this name. And so, um, you know, you can get a little bit of a catalyst, I think maybe up into 3,200, but, um, and obviously that's a pretty good move from where we are now. Um, but I don't think we get the same volatile move higher like we saw in August, at least that same with that same velocity. So uh, I hope that helps. Yeah, absolutely. No, it's, uh, it's really um, fascinating to look at these charts. Uh, and, and and start to understand like uh, the the positions um, um, that the and and the the gamma speed et cetera uh, what the what the dealers how they're going to have to react to it yeah and I, you know and so I I think too what 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 we when we talk about this position um, you know and target points you know it's a it's a very fluid situation what I mean by that is that when I think when strikes get hit it causes people to shift and unwind positions. And, and so in S&P, we can see sort of pins because if people, if the dealers are long gamma, what they're doing is they're pinning a name down, right? As positive gamma means that dealers are hedging against the market. So as the, as the S&P goes higher, they'll sell futures and bring it back down. And as the S&P drops, they buy futures and bring it back up, right? That's that pin area uh, that we'll see oftentimes. And so you can see that set up sometimes in individual stocks, but what I think is when you have these big positions, like Tesla is a, is a great example because the options positions are so big that the thing never rests, right? It's always volatility. And you can have a heck of a lot of volatility in Tesla or you can have just some volatility in Tesla, but it rarely ever sort of hangs around or pins in a certain area. And so, you know, if you look at Tesla for today, you know, 450 is this kind of big area. There's not a lot of people betting on downside right now in this name. Like there's a small drift off, but again, people are positioned for long call. And I think some of this is the battery day thing and 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 the like. And and so what you can see here is again the fuel is there to kind of push this thing higher. These numbers were a multiple higher, and I apologize for these all saying 100. We just need to change the abbreviation on this. Uh, but you can see that 925 is where there's a lot of gamma position, which means that there's a lot of options that are very sensitive to this movement that expire on Friday. And so, you know, typically in Tesla, this is the thing, right? And everyone knows this is a big retail name. People love, you know, to 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 take risk here. Um, and this is 30% of the options gamma expires on Friday. That's a big number. So wherever the biggest options positions are and again 450 is where they are going into Friday this level likely plays into that uh into the name into uh into Friday because um you know because there's so much expiration there so here we're holding kind of the 420 area uh which is you know down around in this zone uh but there's just not the same impetus I don't pick up the same downward velocity position that we had uh right after um right after the August crash uh, if, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, basically, when the when the two lines are are closer together, like uh, like you showed in Amazon, you're you're not you're just kind of it's 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 kind of um, uh, equal. Uh, you, you, there's it's there's balanced. not an imbalance. Yeah. It's yeah, it's balanced. Yeah, um, and that that's sort of you know that and that's how I look at it. This this is like a zone of balance, really, and and that's why I just don't think you know it's not a reason to sell the stock here. Like I don't see a lot of downward movement and again you know if the stock drops 300 bucks you're not going to be happy if you own that um you know clearly but you know there's just balance around this name and there's so much expiration here uh, or concentration at 3000 that i think inevitably the name just sort of mean reverts around that area and, and and waits for a catalyst um and if there was a lot of expiration happening this friday you go you could say okay that's a catalyst to push this thing into a different zone um but the other thing to note is that this map changes every day and we're working on a historical data tool and sort of like a flipbook method so you can sort of see how these things change and how they contextualize. But tomorrow we may see that this blue line suddenly jumps up 
and that could tell you, oh, a lot of other people, right? Sentiment has shifted now in this name because you know the call gamma has really jumped higher. Um, and so again, a lot of this data and information is to help you contextualize uh, the position and sort of you know give you areas, target areas. Um, so whatever your strategy may be, you can overlay this information on top of that strategy and, and use this data to help. Um, you know, again, map out where where some of your trades may uh, may want to take place. Yeah, yeah, excellent. So, and then and then, um, did you have some examples? Maybe um, uh, I guess with some of the stocks in there, maybe uh, you don't have them in the um, uh, 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 in the column there, the notes column. Um, I don't have, unfortunately, the notes column. I need to, I need to sort of populate that. So I need to I need to back off. Or I need to. Um, Back off. I need to add in some of the, the single stock metrics in here. Um, so, you know, if we want to take a quick look at, at Netflix and just see what's happening in there. So this is kind of a similar situation to the Amazon where, you know, it sort of seems like it's pretty balanced here, like putting calls. If it breaks above the 500 area, you could really see a pretty good run as this is fairly steep position. This is a decent amount of gamma. Um, the other thing that's interesting to note too is how much volume took place. So you can see a lot of times in the name, like the one I remember is Peloton, and and I think if I want to look up Oracle volume for today, um, you'll see big increases in volume for the day before. Or if you look at today's data, uh, you know, in your broker's platform, you can see that a lot of calls are taking place. You know, that in combined with the way that this is already positioned can really give you a lot of information uh, and really help you analyze, you know, good setups um you know to position yourself for you know the momentum trade so to speak uh yeah oracle's only had 34,000 contracts trade today which is not too big uh so in netflix again sorry you know 500 is this kind of key transition level where it's like if i was going to get long maybe over 500 it makes it pretty interesting and under here it's just sort of a you know a balanced sort of grind or chop area um which sort of seems to rhyme with maybe what the stock is doing today uh, so it was Key level at 4480 or not yeah so brent do you have an example of like what you're looking in the order flow to to maybe meet um some of those levels or you know when when you might take a position yeah uh so when i'm when i'm you know when you're looking in the order flow obviously what i'm generally looking is for the large volume to line up and you know with some of these different levels and what matters, right? So, you know, there's a lot of volume taking place, for example, and, and Apple, which is a good one, and you can see there's positions building around this 110 area. Uh, but what you'll see is that the liquidity, much like an ES, will show up around, you know, where these big levels take place. Um, and so, you know, just sort of like when we're monitoring an ES, we look for inflection points, you know, be it stop runs or be it, you know, large volume nodes, so to speak, like around 109 here. And I think a lot of times those reversals can be the result of options being uh, placed or unwound in the name. And so, you know, Apple has this 110 area, which matters a lot to it. And what you'll be able to do is cross-reference the a lot of these key options areas with significant turning points in the name on an intraday basis. Uh, and so Apple, you know, obviously 110 is a area which just keeps showing up in this name here and you can see there's big volume nodes around that level uh, but you know when i look at this move this big print in the reversal you know this to me is something that just really seems like an options trade be it somebody put a trade on or un unwound it uh, but you know this volume in this type of position can often speak to options positions being added or removed and so i'm always looking for uh either signs of icebergs um or other stop runs into and around these kind of big strikes and then when they coincide particularly with big zones um or big uh you know key strikes or key areas then i know that's a pretty good signal that something you know major happened in, in the in the option space can you zoom vertically there you go zoom vertically and i was just wondering like because uh, you, you mentioned 112 earlier i think in, in apple yeah yeah, and this is where I shot myself in the foot there a little is. bit because I don't have the uh, I don't have the historical data to wind back, and I and I apologize for that. But you can see, um, sorry, I have to zoom back out there. So you can see here 11250. I mean, you know, there's there's just a lot of volume that went down. Obviously, that was a big print on the close, um, and you know 11250 as of our map yesterday. Uh, so the map changed today, but the map for yesterday had 11250. If I scroll back to it here.
So here's the map for yesterday. Um, you know, the 112.50 area was the big strike or the big region to watch. And and you can see that that, that volume really printed there. Sorry, flip back to the right screen here. Uh, in 112.50, you know, there was a lot of volume. And then down around 112, again, is another, seems to be another large liquidity area. Um, and what's also so interesting about this 112 and this sort of move that opens on Monday morning is that, uh, excuse me, uh, what happens this morning is that a lot of times as these positions are expiring or unwinding, yes, by 15, you, 22. apologies for that, you have this issue of dealers having to unwind hedges after expiration. So to tie back into that, and granted this was yesterday and not sort of the Monday, but if you look at the move Monday morning, a lot of these names, there has to be an unwind of hedges that were in place on the Friday expiration. And a lot of times that volume, I think, can really show up in the morning after as those uh, positions are are moved around uh, and shifted. When I speak those positions, I mean those hedging positions. Um, and so, you know, I think that at the moment, you know, the fact that those 112 positions have disappeared means that this name can really kind of start to drift down. But again, it's, it's a pretty neutral position in here. Um, and so, if it breaks 115, you could see it really start to pick up. And I would expect that, you know, we would see some kind of stop run or, or position change if we sort of break up above this volume band, um, you know, and, and start to move forward. It could really catch some momentum. But as we're sort of under this grind area, you know, you can see there's just a lot of mean reverting. There's not any real clear, you know, zone of, of volume or change. Um, and the name is kind of just sort of floating around, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, let me see. There's a few uh, kind of detailed questions here. Um, um, Silvio is like talking about or asking about the different um, uh, nomenclature and different phrases you're using, like uh, put wall, gamma, uh, delta strike price, um, or key strike, um, volume trigger. Uh, is there sure. a latest version um, of nomenclature? And second uh, question is the the volatility trigger uh, for single stock. Uh, uh, single equities uh, like we have in the SPX. Yeah, the so the volatility trigger we call the hedge wall, and again we differentiate because we all we believe that single stocks are always in a negative gamma position. So in SPX, the volatility trigger tells you when gamma shifts from positive to negative, and that infers that volatility will really pick up when we enter a negative gamma market. In stocks, we assume that there's always this negative gamma position. So the hedge wall is the same model that detects the volatility trigger in, in SPX, but in stocks, we think it's a very key hedging area. So 115 in Apple, uh, we would look for that to be significant resistance. Um, and if it can break that, you know, here you can see that over 115 is where the calls really pick up. So we would look for resistance here, but if it does break, then we would expect a you know, really rather large move up in the name. Um, the key delta strike and the key gamma strike, we have these on a, on a FAQ in our, on our site, and there's a glossary of terms here um, for subscribers, but basically what you need to know is the gamma strike tells you where the largest concentration of options gamma is, which, at which strike that is, and that tells you the level that's most sensitive to options movement would be 115. Um, so we would consider probably some type of a pin, again, resistance area there in the case of Apple. The key delta strike tells you where the largest in the money options are so there are a lot of people who own in the money calls at the 75 strike so that's all the way down here so that's essentially like synthetic stock position essentially because they're deep in the money calls and they don't expire until january so there's some big players who are probably holding essentially uh deep in the money call options that don't expire till january so it'll be very interesting to watch in january how those positions are changed or rolled uh, because that's going to be a lot of volume that dealers may have to unwind on there uh but this is telling you there's you know likely institutional guys you know have big deep in the money calls in this level and that's essentially like a synthetic stock area um and then our model also picks up these hedging bands these hedging bands are there to tell you where sort of gamma tails off in a name and sort of where we think momentum stops so if we were playing a momentum trader looking for a very volatile move we would want to play that inside of these hedging bands Oftentimes, you know, the hedging bands do sort of pick up or show up at, an, at a number that's kind of, you know, off the radar, like 250 in this case. But if you switch to some of the other names, um, they'll be a little more reflective of sort of what's around at the money. Again, when we're modeling 3,800 different names, not every metric will always apply to every name, um, but they all do have a, the model is always picking up different things. 
um, and you know, depending on the name and the situation, these levels will adjust you know pretty rapidly. Uh, and then the other thing to note in here is uh, you know, top call positions. So where are the most call positions that happens to be at the 125 strike? There's a lot of puts at 100. That's the biggest area of put uh, strike. So if, the, if Apple did sort of start to break down to 100, you know, there's a lot of puts that are going to start picking up juice, so to speak. And that can be kind of a volatility uh, trigger. So if you wanted to sort of look at it that way. Um, and, then, and then these other numbers, next gamma expiration number percentage tells you the percentage of gamma that's expiring on this next Friday's expiration. 15% is not particularly big. If this said 50%, then you go, okay, this is a this expiration is a big catalyst in this name, and I would expect it to opt to, to I would expect the name to change the way that it trades uh, on Friday into Monday, and I'd want to play that play that accordingly. Okay, uh, let's see. Uh, Nazar is asking if uh, you can focus a bit on the zero gamma strike uh, and the volume trigger levels. Sure. Um, so that that would be an ES uh, an ES question and not a single stock question. Is that right? Correct. Okay. So sure. So um, we we passed this gamma flip line uh, called the zero gamma level uh, a couple of days ago. It was around 33.50, 33.25, sort of in that area. And basically, what that is telling you is that when we have positive gamma, as the market starts to drop, dealers are buying futures. But the lower the market goes, the less futures dealers are buying. And then we hit this line called zero gamma. And what zero gamma is marking is that is the spot where, again, our model says that dealers are going to go from buying futures as the market drops to selling futures as the market drops. And so the idea is that once you pass that level, if the market continues to drop, dealers are going to start now shorting futures. And so what that infers is that you're going to have a big initial volatility expansion, right? That simply means that the market could saw pretty sharp after that level. So after you have that initial break and that initial sell-off following a break of the volatility trigger or the, excuse me, the zero gamma area or volatility trigger, the, the terms are a little bit um, ubiquitous. What, what that is telling you is negative gamma is telling you there's going to be a lot of volatility in the market. And that is because, again, as the market sells off, dealers have to sell. Well, what happens now if momentum shifts and the market starts to rise, rise that means dealers got to buy to keep up, right? They're going to cover those shorts. And so all of a sudden now you're getting, you know, two, 3% moves in a day. You know, like yesterday we had a huge sell off in the morning and then we made all that back at the end of the day and you have just these giant swings, right? And that is what negative gamma is really implying or inferring. Um, so again, you want to sort of maybe change how you're trading or adjust your style based on positive or negative gamma in terms of, you know, how many handles are you looking to capture on a move, uh, or how, you know, how far can a move happen or how far can a move go, um, based on if it's a negative gamma position or a positive gamma position in the market. Um, so hopefully that, that helps answer that question. Yeah, I mean, why? I'm just curious on the on the zero um, uh, gamma level. Like, why are they turning around and starting to sell? It has to do essentially with whether the market is uh, controlled by calls or puts. So, we assume that dealers are long calls in SPX, which means that they're they have a positive gamma position in calls, and then we assume that they're short puts in SPX. So that's another way of saying that in general, we assume that there's a lot of volatility, um, uh, VRP. So, you know, volatility risk premium. In other words, people are selling calls, big institutions sell calls as a way to, uh, as a way to make money. And that means that dealers are net long calls in SPX. So that's different from single stock, right? Single stock, we assume the opposite. And then obviously we think most people are buying puts as a hedge in SPX. So that means dealers are short those puts. So there's a line in the sand where dealers go from having to hedge out a long call position to having to short futures to hedge out puts. Does that make sense? So short if you future. consider, yeah, yeah right. So, so, you know, Bruce, if you, if, if I'm a market maker or dealer and, and you say, Brian, I'm going to buy a thousand, you know, 3,300 strike puts for me, uh, particularly if you do that order electronically and I can't prepare myself, I suddenly I'm short a whole bunch of puts, and if the market is dropping, I need to short futures as the way to hedge myself. And so, the bigger your position is, the more puts you buy, the more I have to short futures, and I have to hedge, right? And right. so, that can really drive the price down, particularly if the market is illiquid. And then, conversely, let's say that yesterday morning, oh, you say, Brent, this is great. You know, I made so much money on my long puts. I'm gonna, I wanna, I wanna close that position, and you sell your puts. 
Well, if I'm the deal on the other side of that, I just bought back those puts from you, right? So now I'm flat. I don't have a put position anymore. I was short, now I'm flat. Now suddenly I have all these short futures that I got to buy back. And so there I go. I got to start buying those futures back and I get that mean reversion in this case, you know, that kind of volatile move back higher. And so what that zero gamma point is kind of telling you is the, and the way to think of it is the demarcation line between when dealers are sort of hedging out some rather benign call positions to, uh oh, like we're short, you know, we need to start shorting futures to hedge ourselves. Understood. Um, let's see here. Uh, Nazar has another question. Um, uh, in any, uh, what what is the uh, uh, translation you use between the ES and the uh, SPY? Uh, so we just take the, uh, it's, I believe it's 12 handles today. Uh, we just look at on a generally in the cash open. Um, we just look at where ESZ is trading versus SPX, and that's the level we use. So it should be a little bit more like I guess nine today. I think we have it at 12, so I can we can adjust that. But uh, we've tried some different ways to automate that spread, and it and it really hasn't been great. So uh, all we're doing is we look at where futures are trading, you know, at the open versus cash, and then and then make that adjustment. Okay. Uh, let's see here. A few more questions. Um, sure. Uh, when is the data refreshed? So the single stock data is refreshed every morning. Uh, we try to do it by 3 a.m., um, but it's done definitely by 6 a.m. And that will all be automated a little bit earlier. Um, and then as far as S&P, uh, for our advanced subscribers, which is what you need to uh, get the bookmap feed, that data is run at uh, 3 a.m. Eastern. And that's sort of the biggest change in the data. And then we do refresh again at the close. Uh, but generally, that closing data is not as big of a change or adjustment as the AM uh, data run. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Um, yeah, Samuel is asking about looking at the, the S&P and, and maybe going through some of the levels. Um, <clears throat> sure. I'm happy to do that. So, Today, um, you know, we have a negative gamma scenario or negative gamma position, uh, which means that there's not, you know, the space between levels is pretty big, which is why we only see really two on the screen today. Uh, obviously, 3267 we picked up as one, and then 3300 is the other level. Um, if you go to our uh, portal page, we have a little toolbar that shows you. And again, if you um, we we publish this stuff all to, to cloud notes um so you have all the levels and if i zoomed way out you'd see some of the other ones but hopefully you can see this little pop-up window <clears throat> so for today this is where all of our different levels line up um and these are the futures adjusted prices again we're using 12 points so some of these levels have moved way off because we had a big expiration uh and so what that big expiration does is it drops the total amount of open interest at various strikes. And that can ob often lead to sort of a lot of the levels being kind of pushed way out. And the, and the significant ones sort of have a larger meaning, uh, but they're a little bit more spaced out. So what I mean by that is if it was a positive gamma market and we were looking at, you know, all this position here, you know, this is 50 handles, we would probably have two or three levels that really mattered in here. But because we have the negative gamma position, our levels have, you know, widened out a little bit, so to speak. And on here, you know, we have this volatility trigger, which I can touch on quickly. The volatility trigger is our, our model um, senses a different way of picking up where dealers are actually going to start significantly shorting futures. Uh, and then, you know, conversely, if we get over that volatility trigger level, where will they actually start buying futures? And, <clears throat> excuse me, so the difference between the volatility trigger and zero gamma is that zero gamma is just telling you where dealers don't actually have to hedge anymore, right? Because if you think about zero gamma, Gamma is a measurement of how much dealers are going to have to hedge. So if gamma is zero, that's telling you that they have no hedge at that point. Below there, they may have to start selling futures, but you know, essentially zero gamma is they have no position to hedge. The volatility trigger is telling you where the significant infl inflection point is of where they will actually start selling some kind of consequential position in futures or buying some kind of major position in futures. So we're generally, when we're trading, we're going off of the volatility trigger in terms of where do we want to start shorting or buying futures. You know, that the break of that level, you know, whether we go, uh, you know, through it on the downside or upside, that's the level where we are really watching. What's interesting is the zero gamma point has become a support or resistance level, and that's why we include it. 
we think it's something like a 200 day moving average where it shouldn't really mean anything to the market right because zero gamma means no hedging uh but people watch it and so i think it's become like a technical indicator or a line along those um along those points and we had a write-up on our site about this for those that want to uh, you know, dig into a little bit more. And then the other thing we know are these large gamma strikes. So large gamma strikes are simply telling you where big options positions are, are located. So 3350, 3300, 3250. There's a whole bunch of open interest at all of those areas. And so, you know, those positions tend to be concentrated at 33, you know, at numbers that end in five zero or zero zero. Um, and that just is telling you again, where these big open interest positions are, uh, have accumulated and where the market may gravitate towards, right? Because my view is that hedging flows tend to concentrate around those big strikes. And so you wanna know what the biggest strikes are because those can be the he the largest draw. And then lastly is the idea of combos. And, and these have been sort of, I think my most, my biggest surprise in terms of uh, the accuracy of these levels. And what this is doing is it's looking at all the open interest in the SPX and all the open interest in the SPY. And then our model combines that open interest and then normalizes the price. So the combo level simply means SPY, SPY, XPX combined. And so you get these strange strikes because we're looking at where SPY is trading also. So that is why 3267, which is an odd strike, you know, no SPX options are listed at that strike, but it, but it's, what it's telling you is there's a big influence of spiders likely you know uh, i don't know it could be 327 or something like that and spiders has a lot of open interest and that's why we're getting this weird blended price level but these levels will oftentimes show up as major support and resistance zones um and and combo simply means again it's picking up spiders and spx which you know they trade off of the same index they're very linked together um and so spiders should be considered when you're looking at open interest and then the last thing to note is we talked about this implied move um, so we take the amount of gamut in the market and we look historically back at how much range in the market or how much volatility is associated with that level of gamma. So based on that, we'd say a one standard deviation move for today is 1% in the market. And that based on the time that we snapped the data would imply essentially this is the upper and lower bound for the market on a one standard deviation move. So hopefully that makes sense. So every day we tell you, okay, a one standard deviation move in the, in the market's gonna be plus or minus 1%, and this is the anticipated range that, that we would see. We also do this on a five-day basis because we think that there's some relationship between the, you know, the rolling five-day expiration um, as well as you know, the intraday or one-day uh, move. Um, so hopefully that covers the, the metrics at a kind of a macro level. Please let me know if there's one that I missed. No, I think that uh, defines it really well. It's 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 fascinating though, those combo levels. Um, how the yeah, it, it makes sense. You know, you got the different players from uh, uh, the different instruments, and uh, um, those are major inflection points. Yeah, and you know, I I, I I struggle you know with sometimes these things a lot. There's a lot of people that will produce, and and I you know I think uh i'm not trying to point fingers at anybody or anything but you know you produce a thousand levels and you put them all on a chart and go look our level hit today right and well every five points you have another level of course some level is going to get hit right and so we're very careful about not inundating people with levels so i know when you look at this chart you see oh brent's got you know spot gamma has got 25 levels on here but these are all spaced way out you know a lot of these are are not applicable today somewhat similar to single stock stuff there are a couple that matter right and so you know i would leave it to the to you all to assess whether or not this was a successful support area you know we didn't break the level we got within you know two handles of it um and and that is the kind of thing that we'll often see right in terms of you know how close we get into some of these areas and where just sort of the overall general significant support and resistance lines are on the day you know these combo strikes really show up quite often and, and it's been very interesting to watch yeah yeah i just have, and there's a few more questions here i i actually had a, had a question as well like the way that you um are trading some of the futures here um and you said that you were looking for um uh, lots of volume uh moving in the direction um that uh, uh, you're anticipating there due to the, yeah. the gamma, but uh, also let I me mean, like like going into that combo level there. I, I would just imagine like you could just scoop up such good deals um, if you 
uh, are anticipating some of these levels. Um, and then uh, uh, implied volatility is obviously going to be dropping uh, pretty, pretty, pretty fast uh, around that combo level. Um, and then like trading options from that level uh, on up uh, in SPX or, or, or in the ES. Yes. Yeah, and I so that's that's uh, you know it's a very interesting point, and um, you guys have these fantastic new tools, the the iceberg um, trackers, and and some of these stop run mechanisms, and I have a lot of subscribers that have sent me charts that show that those data points coincide with each other, and I'm, I apologize, I don't have it loaded up in here. Um, that you know you can get there's a there's a a signal that confirms around these combo levels and I've had multiple people tell me this and so you know all of you are are, are likely you know well versed in book map and, and you guys show a lot of the tools that show you that this is a level that shows up from spot gamma because there's a big option position there right and then you will see a confirming signal uh, be it a you know beat an iceberg or a stop run or some other type of flow that is shown up in the system that confirms this area as significant, right? And so um, I don't think that you need to sort of just take our level, you know, and say like, this is the only thing I need to watch for. I think you will see that there is a fingerprint or something that be could be construed as dealer activity or market maker activity around this level. So if you're, what I'm trying to get at is know where these levels are and you'll see something happen in the market that confirms that there will be a reaction here. I guess is what I'm is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, exactly. Something in the order flow that gives you a key, and and one of them being like on the way down, just like just massive absorption on the bid. Um, right. Right. Uh, and it's and it's you know it's I mean this is unfortunately uh, you know the way that I had this configured, and and I need to go to Bookmap School to to improve this, no doubt. Um, but you know there is. There's a lot of liquidity kind of taking place, you know, in this area, right? Like there was, there's really no bids, I mean, you know, taking place or any significant buying taking place. And then for whatever reason here, you know, things pick up, right? And granted, this is, you know, a couple of handles higher than what we sort of had estimated here. Um, but this is a random spot to sort of for for this inflection point to take place. In other words, like if it was at 3,300, I think anyone could look at. Oh, 3,300. Well, it makes sense that, that would be resistance. It's a big round number, right? Or 3,250. That makes sense because again, it's it's it ends in 50, and people people are going to psychologically pay attention to that. You know, these numbers will turn at odd handles. You know, 67 or 53 or whatever, right? Um, and so th there's there's absolutely something to it, and I think your tools, the book map metrics that you have, the iceberg tracker, et cetera, as I mentioned before, I've had other subscribers. You know, point to these things as co as confirming signals um, that just give the levels a little more veracity, so to speak. Yeah, that's is excellent. I mean, just it's again just higher time frame levels, and then looking at the order flow, basically. Um, right, right. And so, you know, on on a move like today, you know, I I personally, and I I can't offer trading advice. I can't tell you what would work for you or for not. Uh, but I also have subscribers that just swing trade between these two big levels, right? Like you need to under, you need to sort of assess where you think the market's going higher or lower, and then, you know, just ride between these two big levels. And what's sort of interesting is that was sort of the way it played out this morning, you know, 3,300 down to 32, you know, 57 or 60. You know, if you want to say that this level mattered here, uh, you know, I feel like it did. And then, you know, this may well mean revert right back into this other big area. Um, so it's time frame is sort of I guess what your strategy is and, and how you want to overlay these things I guess. Okay, uh, let's see um, a few uh, technical questions. Uh, John um, is um, if you're asking about how to get this into the uh, into the chart like a uh, spot gamma has like on on the left hand uh, column there, uh, that's part of the subscription service in his notes column, uh, and then. Um, uh, Jason, um, Jason's asking you if you have a service for index levels only for the stocks. It's just, but it's just all all stocks. I mean, it's not like just SPY and and uh, uh, QQQ or all that. I guess yeah, that's what you're well, that's asking. that's what the equity. Yeah, the equity. So the equity hub is is our product with our single stock for product. All. Okay. Right. So that that shows everything. So if you just go into this subscribe now button here, I don't mean to 
advertise here, but it's just this equity hub here. So this is 3,800 different names that you can analyze on your own. It, with our standard membership in the book map, uh, advanced membership, we send out a daily email also that gives our blurb about what we think is happening in the market. And then you get all the levels and then you get the cloud notes. If Equity Hub is just the Equity Hub tool, so you can sort of run your own analysis, so to speak. But that gives you access to all the stocks. Okay. Uh, and uh, let's see here. A lot of these questions you've already answered. Um, they're just kind of uh, repeats about the uh, gamma level, zero gamma, et cetera. Uh, and let's see, Sven is asking, at what point uh, start uh, dealers, do dealers start hedging via futures instead of buying, selling single stocks? I... So my, um, my understanding is that the dealers tend to not commingle the book, meaning if they're going to hedge a stock, they hedge it with the underlying stock. And I'm sure there's some overlap in terms of, you know, they know how much of the market they're long or short and there's some overlap. But if you just think about it, you know, how would you, you couldn't have hedged Tesla with like say QQQs, right? It just, it just wouldn't have worked. Tesla was going up 20% every day or whatever and Qs were significantly lagging. So my understanding from talking to market makers is that they will typically use the underlying to hedge the options. So if I'm trading Apple options, I hedge with Apple stock. If I'm trading Microsoft, I use Microsoft. I think there is some, you know, kind of like a beta override, you know, with a lot of this, with a lot of these names. And, and obviously they're looking at things also, you know, from their book as a whole, but in general, you know, they're, they're underlying with, they're hedging with the underlying. And that also could, you know, do they care about hedging Exxon Mobil with the underlying? Probably not as much as they care about hedging, you know, like Zoom or something, right? So um, I, I hope that it helps to answer your question. On a daily basis, the most important hedging time in my view is 415 and that's why you can see a lot of crazy moves and uh, excuse me four o'clock and that's why you can see so many crazy moves into that four o'clock hour uh because at four o'clock you know when the books are closed 415 the books are closed that's when the risk metrics are run and that is when dealers and the like you know their compliance and risk officers are going to be looking at the portfolios to see how much risk is on the books and and dealers got to make sure that they're square right they can't have extraneous risk and so i think that's why a lot of times you'll get uh, kind of wild moves into the close because you know the, the books have to be uh, hedged out you know you know by the close because that's when the that's when the risk is run. Okay, um, I think that that sums it all up. Uh, I've got through all the questions here. Cool. Uh, I, just fascinating stuff. It, it, it's just a, a whole nother level, uh, kind of behind uh, you know just uh, the the direct uh, trading here. Uh, and just these these massive players with these huge positions um, and uh, how it just uh, uh, price is moving within those areas. It's, it's just fascinating, all the, all the different um, uh, dynamics here. Uh, anything else you want to uh, uh, go over kind of uh, 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 last minute here or our final final comments, Brent? Yeah, I would, I would just say, so one of our big pushes here is to add in all these single stock levels uh, into a cloud notes feed. And so, you know, we're really excited to do that so that these levels can just be overlaid onto book map. And, and again, you can look at the stop runs and all these different new tools you guys have rolled out uh, because I think there will be a lot of overlap there. And I'm, I'm really excited to watch that and see that sort of unfold. And so, you know, that's one of our, our big projects here. Um, and I would like to also say I'm very grateful for the opportunity again, Bruce, um, you know, Bookmap's been a great partner of ours and, uh, it's a, it's a fantastic tool to sort of, you know, visualize, uh, what's happening and, and it's been a, it's been a major help for us. Uh, that's excellent. Right. Um, I, I've got to get uh, to this last question here. Kendall has asked like three or four times now, he, he's asking yeah. about Vanna, V-A-N-N-A, um, yeah. and, uh, wondering, uh, uh let's see here exactly what he says here uh example uh will you be seeing more regarding this um uh, does it give an, ex an indication of levels where volatility will end uh for the day session yeah so uh so we're looking at rolling out a vanna metric and so for those of you who aren't familiar with that concept is what vanna is essentially measuring is the amount of deltas that a dealer will need to trade for a given change in implied volatility so to think of this as at a more macro level, if the VIX drops, I believe that the S&P is going to go up, right? And that, and the, and the reason is because the VIX dropping is telling you that implied volatility is going down. So what does that mean? 
that means if implied vol drops, put positions lose value, right? They That is telling you that, oh, the VIX is going down. That's showing you that fear is residing in the market. So the mechanics of that are essentially measured by this, this uh, metric called BANA, and that can tell you that, okay, when VIX goes down or implied volatility drops, that's going to tell me that dealers are going to start buying back short futures, right? And conversely, if the VIX spikes, they're going to start shorting futures or the market could go down. So I tell my subscribers quite often, watch the VIX as a confirmation tool, right? If the VIX is trending lower all day, we're likely going to see the market rise, particularly into the close, because that's telling you, lower VIX is telling you that options are losing value and that's mostly impacted by put positions. And so that's telling you that puts are being closed or they're losing values and some dealers are too short, they're gonna have to buy some stuff back. And you know that mechanism works the other way. So VANA is the actual metric you could use to sort of estimate, okay, here's how much dealers would have to buy or sell for a given change in implied volatility or for another way to think of it sort of crudely is for a given change in VIX. And so we're, we've been working on a few metrics, um, you know, VANA type signal. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times, the change happens in the middle of the day, right? And so you can't really pick that up unless it's sort of a more of a, a little bit more of a real-time metric. Um, you know, I think there's a macro level, which is what we're trying to work out, meaning like a day-to-day -day change. Uh, but like yesterday, the reversal, for instance, I think was largely led off of a bunch of very big put positions that were bought and sold intraday. And so, you know, part of that mechanism, I think that led the rally is this Vanna, we call it a Vanna rally, because implied volatility gets crushed and dealers got to buy back short futures. And so we're working on some metrics to sort of, uh, you know, um, to measure that and and to to make it one of our uh, things to watch, so to speak. Um, but, you know, the underlying force of VANA is this idea that implied vol goes down, dealers got to buy futures back. If implied volatility, i.e. VIX goes up, dealers need to short futures. Okay. Uh, and let's see, just a, a, there was a couple more questions here um, about Nels, about the Brent's uh, Delta, um, uh, quotes Delta configurations. Um, they, if you can right, maybe right click on that and take a look at the uh, the plus minus column that you have there. They're cu curious about your config. Yeah. Yes. Uh, this comes from my good friend, Walter, um, who Bruce, you know well. Yeah. This is this is some of his setup. Um, so what I show the configure column, is that what I'm trying to show you all? Yeah. And you want to so look the, at the plus the, minus, sorry about that. Plus minus one, yeah. Okay, so it's just, just five holes there. Yeah, Yeah. so uh, so Walter's over at Trade to Win. Uh, he's a book map partner as well. If you, I think he's listed on the site. He is a fantastic um, trading tools and uh, he has a trading room and the like. Uh, and he's just a, he's a wonderful individual just in general and uh, I've been using some of his config setup I removed it for this talk because uh, I wasn't familiar with how it worked for single stocks um, so this setup or this um, view you're seeing is related to him okay and then um, let's see Ian is asking about um, uh, which packages will include bookmap integration with cloud nodes Oh, I'm sorry. I, I can answer this one. Advanced or basic? Uh, both will work. Ian, uh, cloud notes is it doesn't matter. So just as long as you're you're set up um, with a, a, a live uh, book map version, global or global plus. Um, yes, yeah, so we just right click and then go to notes, cloud notes, and then there's a CSV we give you that you can plug in here. So this uh, is the CSV for that. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, Let's see, Ian is asking, are you, um, there is a, a feed for futures, um, uh, getting the, the VIX um, uh, from DX feed. Uh, I don't know if you're looking at the VIX in, in Bookmap. He's asking. Me oh, me personally, um, I have not looked at VIX futures. It is a product that I am interested in rolling out. Uh, what we're trying to do is link together VIX and some of those ETPs, VXX and UVXY, and sort of make combo levels out of those. Um, and so that is sort of held up a little bit of the analysis, uh, but it's something that we very much want to do. Okay. Uh, and then I'll just um, uh, mention here, uh, guys, like I, I put all of uh, Spot Gamma's uh, contact information into the chat there, as well as the special offers for Bookmap, if you're interested in that, uh, that you can get from Brent. Um, and then uh, Brent, uh, I'll, I'll uh, 
uh, let you sign off here with um, maybe going through your products again, because uh, Ian is asking about the different um, uh, pricing and uh, which has the integration of cloud notes and book map. Sure. Uh, so I'll just show you this, the site real quick and, and thank you for the opportunity to do that. And I'm trying to uh, over market to you all. But if you just go to our site, which is spotgamma.com and you click subscribe now, the spot gamma advanced is where you get the cloud notes link. Um, and so that this is what gives you that uh, ES link and NQ. So uh, right now you have ES features and NQ features you get the cloud notes for. Um, spiders and QQQ are right around the corner for adding those levels in. And then you can also sign up for the full member, which gives you access to the equity hub as well as the advanced combination. So it's these two combined, which still gives you those cloud notes. And then we'll be rolling out an equity hub advanced, which gets you the cloud notes for all the individual stocks. Um, that should hopefully be out in about a month. Okay, excellent. Um, all right, I, I think that's it then. Uh, well, Great. I mean, uh, excellent uh, stuff, Brent. It's, it's just fascinating stuff and uh, a whole nother level here that uh, most of us just aren't, aren't familiar with uh, whatsoever. <laughs> Yeah, well, 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 I hope it helps. I hope the examples uh, spark some some interest and some thoughts there, and and um, you know, hopefully, most of all, it's useful and, and helps everyone be more profitable. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Brent. Uh, sure. And uh, we'll we'll catch up another time. Uh, That's great. Thanks. Okay. Bye, bye, everybody.